Hey everyone, welcome back to Here's the News. Before I tell you what the news is, because we've got, man, what, seven massive stories for you guys today. Uh, I want to remind you to enter our giveaway down in the description or the pinned comment. We are giving away a $99 Nintendo Switch eShop or $100 PlayStation or Xbox. You know what? Screw it. Let's throw a PC in as well for Steam or whatever uh, platform you prefer on PC. Uh, gift card. Also, we're giving away a $60 game. Ha <laughs> ha, Monster Hunter Rise. That's right. Give away a copy of Monster Hunter Rise for Nintendo Switch. And then add two additional $20 Nintendo Switch, PlayStation, or Xbox gift cards. I know, it's a lot. Just check out the giveaway button, uh, the link and all that. It'll have all the details on how to enter. Uh, it ends at the end of the month. And let's get into the news. So our first story today is about Gotham Knights. They announced today that Gotham Knights is being delayed to 2022. Now, this is the next game from WB, following up the ever popular Batman series that have been going on for a little bit. Uh, in this one, it looks like, based on the trailer reveal they had about six months ago, that obviously we're moving on from Batman himself and moving into side characters in the series. Uh, again, it kind of disappointing to see a game delayed like this, but not unexpected since there are likely to be many, many COVID-related delays, and I presume this is one of them. They don't note that it's delayed specifically because of COVID, but because they want to deliver the best possible experience. So this largely is a good thing so yay gotham knights delayed 2022 our second story is about game pass subscriber info now we don't know the subscriber growth we're going to have to wait for microsoft's official financial report for that but we do have a new article talking about all of the subscriber uh things like how are they making money and how many games are these people playing so it looks like 20 percent more time is spent playing games by people who are subscribed to game pass versus people who aren't obviously this is just examining the xbox ecosystem uh 30 more games in general are played by those subscribed to game pass versus those that aren't and what's even cooler is 40 percent more genres are played by each individual person on game pass than those that aren't now this is obviously because there's a wide variety of games. It's kind of like a Netflix. People participate in more different types of shows and different types of movies on Netflix because they pay one flat fee for access to them all versus going to like a movie theater and having to spend all this money to go to each individual movie. You're probably only going to go to the ones that you know you're going to enjoy versus checking out things you aren't sure if you'll enjoy and that seems to be what's happening on game pass is it's creating a more diverse gaming audience that is just more experienced in general so yeah that's uh pretty cool what's also good for microsoft is it looks like people who are subscribed to game pass spend 20 percent more money than those that aren't now obviously we're not including the original game you know, purchase in there, but once a game is purchased, it looks like 20% more money is spent by those on Game Pass than not. This would be a microtransactions, DLC, uh, in-game currency, all that jazz. Uh, yes, those that are subscribed to Game Pass tend to spend more money on that stuff than those that aren't. So this is kind of a nice experimental territory for Microsoft as they push really into this games as a service ca uh, category and maybe try to become more profitable at it sooner rather than later. So we'll have to see if these numbers continue and what the actual subscriber base is. It's presumed to have grown since the release of Xbox Series X, also expansion to PC but we'll have to wait and see. Payday 3 has left design phases and now in full production. So Payday 3 is obviously the follow-up to the ever-popular Payday and Payday 2. Yes, Payday 2 is also on Switch, so maybe a Switch game. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, right now, they're aiming to release this game in 2023. So yeah, kind of a way early announcement for it, but it is what it is. Uh, they have 18-month post-launch plans for a games-as-a-service deal, which makes a lot of sense for games like Payday because it is an ongoing kind of service game. Uh, it has a co-publishing deal with Koch Media, who is fully supportive of all the marketing and everything. Uh, it uses Unreal Engine, and it will release on PC and consoles. Again, specific consoles not mentioned. But the 2023 release date, you got to assume it's probably leaving PlayStation 4 and Xbox One behind. 
Is it going to leave Switch behind? Is it going to be on Switch Pro? I, who knows? 2023 is a long ways away. At least it feels that way. I hope it's a long ways away. It is just 2021. So anyways, Payday 3 is likely going to be a fantastic game, and I can't wait to experience it. So keeping our theme of Microsoft stories today, we have a rumor for you guys, fresh out of the Jeff Grubb Games Beat journalistic rumor mill, and that is that Starfield is going to be completely blown out by Microsoft at E. Three. Oh, and by the way, it's releasing this year, barring a COVID-related delay. So, yeah, it could be delayed because of COVID, but right now it's still slated to come out this year. Now, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this game and if it continues to be a multi-platform game or not. There was a point last year in October where Todd Howard came out and basically said I, he doesn't foresee Starfield or Elder Scrolls VI uh, being exclusive to xbox but that was back in october before say uh, finalized even phil spencer back then was trying to be really coy on what was going to be exclusive or not now phil spencer's been like yeah we're making everything that doesn't have a contract exclusive we don't know that starfield had a contract to be on playstation but if it is slated to release this year it does kind of give playstation gamers a little bit of hope since it would have obviously been almost done with development and probably have a playstation version in existence but again it's microsoft's ip now so all bets are off the table when it comes to it going multi-platform. Well, if you haven't been paying attention, there's actually a massive sale on the Nintendo Switch eShop. Now, the eShop actually always has a lot of sales. I think there's over 800 games on sale right now. Pretty insane. But there's actually a bunch of notable games, and I'm going to go through a long list of them, but there's actually several that aren't. First, we're going to start with a bunch of Ubisoft offerings. Uh, so we have Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered going for $15.99 right now when it's usually $40. Bucks. We have Immortals Phoenix Rising, which, oh my gosh, you guys need to play it if you love Breath of the Wild, I'm telling you. Uh, it is for $29.99 right now when it's usually $60. Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle is now hit its lowest price on the eShop at $9.99. Normally $60. There's also the Battle uh, Gold Edition version of it for $13.59. That's usually $80. So that includes all the DLC and all that. So whew, I think it's worth spending the extra money to get that. Uh, we have South Park the Fractured Butthole Edition at uh, $14 when it's usually $50. We have South Park the Stick of Truth, which is usually $11, which is actually $11.99 right now, and that's usually uh, $60. Oh, I'm sorry, that's usually $30. Uh, we have Starlink Battle for Atlas Deluxe Edition for $23.99. That's normally $80. And then Starlink Battle for Atlas Digital Edition uh, for $14.99, and that's usually $60. And I, again, Starlink to me is also one of those underrated Ubisoft games. Really should check out, especially if you're like a fan of Star Fox and slash Star Fox Adventure. It's kind of like a combo. It's really interesting. All right, that ends the Ubisoft portion. Uh, there are other Ubisoft games on sale if you're interested. Uh, just nothing that I felt was notable. Uh, now we have just a random smorgasbord, including a ton of Final Fantasy games. So we have Final Fantasy VII, the original, uh, is now $7.99 when it usually sells for $16. Final Fantasy X uh, is $10.49 when it's usually $21. Bucks. Final Fantasy IX is now $9 when it's usually 20 bucks. Uh, Final Fantasy X and X2 is now $24.99 when it's usually $50. Uh, same is true for Final Fantasy XII as it's now $24.99 when it's usually $50. Borderlands Legendary Collection is now $19.99 when it's usually $50. Bucks. Trials of Mana is now $29.99 when it's usually $50. And I finally might buy that game. It's the one Mana game I haven't played. And this is the remastered one, so I'll have to give it a try here. Uh, NBA 2K21 is now $19.79. Although, let's be honest, NBA 2K21 is almost always, like, discounted at this point. Uh, we have Bioshock Collection at $19.99. It's usually $50. Okami HD at $9.99, when it's usually $20. And Civ 6 at $19.79, which is usually $60. This and more great deals are going on on the Nintendo Switch eShop. So go check it out if you happen to have some spare coinage and you're looking for more games to play. Our next story is a big one, especially for people who enjoy events like E3, although this isn't E3, it's potentially the replacement for E3. Gamescom is coming back this year. Now look, Gamescom's been going on for a while, but they seem to have a firm plan and it includes in-person stuff. So they're going to have in-person demos for a limited amount of visitors that's focused exclusively on new games. There's a couple other minor in-person things. They are going to have like a cosplay gathering and stuff like that, but they're very restrictive in who's going to be able to attend. Uh, 
probably you know because of covid so we'll see how it plays out but they are having an in-person event which is interesting since e3 is not having anything in person if they even have an event at all they are going to expand their digital events as well now for those who don't know gamescom always has press conferences and stuff just like e3 they're usually just not as big of a deal as the e3 ones but if people choose not to go to e3 maybe they choose to go to gamescom uh there's also going to be uh jeff Keeley returning to support this which is interesting jeff Keeley supported every single e3 until last year and then e3 didn't happen jeff Keeley is now hosting uh opening night live which includes a bunch of game reveals and all that uh for gamescom so yeah that's you know interesting to look forward to as we get closer to gamescom which always happens later in the year uh we will have to give it a look you know towards the end of summer i'm, I'm pretty excited to see gamescom come back i'm excited to see the digital event expanded we'll see if there's going to be more and more press conferences we'll live react to all of that when it's appropriate our final story today is about shimigami 2 nocturne hd remaster now technically the release date got leaked but now it's been all officially announced we have a bunch of official information um so let me just get to my notes because whoo there's a lot to get over here. So it does arrive on May 25th. That's the big thing to remember if you're looking forward to Shin Megami Tensei 2. Uh, we have a digital deluxe edition of it, which there's some things in here. I, well, one thing in particular I'm not excited about here. It comes with the full game. Also, if you get the digital deluxe edition, you'll be able to play four days early. You get the Maniacs pack, which adds Dante from Devil May Cry. You also get the Chronicle pack, which adds Raidu from Devil Summoner series. You get Merciful Difficulty as well, which adds an easier difficulty mode, which we'll get into this later because I don't like that. Uh, Mercy and Expectation Map Pack, which adds Little Master's Mercy and Master's Expectations. Uh, there's also the... Uh, the Shimigami Tensei BGM pack, which is music. Uh, so we have the BGM pack one, which has two songs from Shimigami Tensei. We have the BGM pack two, which has two songs from Shimigami, Shimigami Tensei two. Oh God, the faster you say it, the harder it is to say. There's a BGM pack three from Shimigami Tensei four that has two songs, and a BGM pack four, which has Shimigami Tensei four Apocalypse. A couple songs from that as well. Uh, the normal game is going to be forty nine ninety nine. The digital deluxe edition is going to be $69.99, so uh, it's a pretty decent amount more. That's 20 bucks more. There's, it's going to have remastered 3D models and backgrounds, uh, additional difficulty levels, maybe even beyond the one that's in the digital deluxe version, a suspend save, English and Japanese voiceover, and an alternative branch featuring Radu. I can't pronounce his last name, so I won't even bother. Here's the thing. I actually think this is really great news for gamers, especially those that have never experienced the original, which in most people's opinion is one of the best games on PlayStation 2. But here's the thing. Locking difficulty modes behind a deluxe version, aka paid DLC, is dumb. And you see this back here? That's like a little image on the, on the monitor from Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild did the same thing. And I hated it. They locked Master Mode behind Paid DLC, which is basically hard difficulty. Here they're locking the easiest difficulty mode, which might be, you know, you might say, who cares? It's the easiest difficulty mode. Well, for gamers like me that don't have a lot of time, sometimes the easy difficulty modes are fun if you just want to experience the story. You have to pay extra for that. For a game that came out back on PlayStation 2, I got to pay extra for an easier mode today? Stupid! Stupid, 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 stupid. Again, I will never agree with charging extra money for difficulty modes, be it harder or easier. It's dumb. It's a practice I want to see eliminated. But it's not going to go anywhere because they keep tagging it in with other content releases. Why did Master Mode work for Breath of the Wild? Because they tied it in with a DLC packs that ended up including extra story content. I know the first DLC pack that came in didn't, but um, you know people bought the combo bundle for that. So... I, I think it's stupid. I think this just is not a fun direction for the industry, not positive for consumers. Most of you guys aren't going to end up caring because you either bought, we're going to get the DLC for Breath of the Wild anyways, or already have, or like you weren't interested in this game in the first place, so who cares? But this is starting to become, you know, coming up more and more and more often in the industry where difficulty modes are something we pay for and isn't just part of the game. I hate I'm not sure I can get behind that. But you know what? That is today's Here's the News. Uh, not as obviously big and dramatic as the one yesterday when we had the massive stuff going on with Switch Pro, which I know basically everyone skipped to. But hey, you know what? Not every episode of Here's the News is going to have all the banger news. But there's some good stuff in here if you're a Microsoft fan. All that jazz. Um, Shimigami Tensei fan. Like sales on the eShop. 
All right, folks. I'm Nathaniel Robojans from Nintendo Prime, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.